everyone. Welcome to Berean Baptist Church. Let's go ahead and find a place to grab a songbook and turn to page number 294. 294. Stand with me if you would, please. No other plea. My faith has found a resting place, not in device nor creed. I trust the ever-living one, his wounds for me shall bleed. I need no other argument, I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died, and that he died for me. Enough for me that Jesus saves, this ends my fear. asking Brother Mick Reagan if he'd come up and, and uh, lead us in a word of prayer start the services this evening. Our dear God, Father, we thank you once again that we have this opportunity to gather here in this house. And Lord, we're grateful to you for everything that you provide and give us. Lord, we just ask for your blessings tonight upon the services. Father, we ask you to search our hearts as we sing to you, as we worship you. Father, as we have the word preached to us, God, that we give you the glory for all things. Lord, as we love you, God, and we thank you now in your son's name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. All right, turn to page number 29, page number 29. We are more than conquerors through him who loved us so. The Christ who dwells within us is the greatest power we the greatest power we know. We are more than conquerors through him who loved us so. The Christ who dwells within us is the greatest power we know. He will fight beside us though the enemy is great. Who can stand against us 
he's the captain of our fate. Then we will conquer, never fear, so let the battle rage. He has promised to be near until the end of the age. We are more than conquerors through him who loved us so. is the greatest power we know. Amen. You may be seated and turn to page number 258. 258. Oh, how I love Jesus. Amen. There is a name I love to sing. I love to sing. It's worth, it sounds like music in my ear, the sweetest name on earth. Oh, how I love Jesus, oh, how I love Jesus, oh, how I love Jesus, because he first loved me. It to set me free. It tells me of his precious blood, a sinner's perfect lead. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus because he first loved me. Tells me what my Father hath in store for every day. And though I tread a darksome path, yield sunshine all the way. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because he first loved me, it tells me one whose loving heart can feel my deepest woe, who in each sorrow bears the part that none can bear below. Oh, how I love Jesus! Oh, how I love Jesus! Oh, how I love Jesus because he first loved me. Amen. All right. Well, <clears throat> tonight we have a special treat for you because we're going to listen to Brother Stevens here this evening. Um, he's going to be preaching to us. Pastor will be back uh, this Friday coming up. Um, the next day on January 16th, we'll have all church outreach at 10 a.m. in the morning. And then Sunday, coming up uh, next Sunday, we'll have the Lord's Table in the morning service. The following Monday um, at, at uh, 10 a.m., they're going to have a teen skate activity. And then uh, there'll be a time of food at the church. You meet at the church first. Food, games, and God's Word. And then they'll head to Roy Rayleigh Park for ice skating. The cost is four dollars for including the skates and three dollars if you have your own next the following thursday after that when pastors here of course we'll start faith bible institute that in, that evening so uh, please come at 5, 6 15 p.m to receive your materials and orientation the new ladies prayer meeting will be that following saturday um, at 10 a.m so um, this Saturday coming up at 10 a.m. There will be an all-church um, outreach. Then following uh, Saturday after that, there will be that first ladies' prayer meeting that Pastor was talking about, led by Mrs. Watkins. So um, that's the announcements as far as that goes. Um, it's good to have the Stevens here with us tonight. We're going to sing a couple more songs here, but um, 
I didn't really know Brother Stevens as well as, as I could have. Um, over the past two, two Christmases, I've spent two Christmases with them, a little bit, little bit of time together with them, and then uh, I've done some work on their house lately. Um, but uh, I'll tell you what, Brother Stevens has a unique insight into, into life and into God's Word, and I really appreciate him. And I appreciate his wife, Diana. They've been good friends to my wife and uh, her family uh, for many years. And um, I remember the first time I heard Brother Stevens preach over in the old uh, uh, church building that we had many, many years ago. And uh, um, he's going to be a blessing to us tonight, I'm absolutely sure. So praise the Lord for that. Let's turn in our songbooks again to page 201, 201. Turn to page number 275, 275. Let's go. 
Stevens, why don't you come on and preach to us? Tell us a little bit about your ministry. And um, tell us what God's laid on your heart, sir. You're welcome to adjust that microphone. <clears throat> Brother Mark's a big unit, ain't he? Uh, well, if you want to know a little bit something about the last several years at the penitentiary, all you got to do is watch Wednesday's uh, news clip about what went on at the White House. Pretty similar. Uh, <clears throat> there's a word in the Bible, uh, reprobate. God gave people over to reprobate mind. I looked that up in Webster's Dictionary. It means unruly. Boy, it's got unruly, hasn't it? Amen. Well, I <clears throat> don't think we're supposed to be surprised if we're reading a Bible regularly. I think, I think he's running on schedule, don't you all? I've uh, been uh, been at the penitentiary now right at 22 years. First time I rolled into this town, I had flew into Portland back in 1999 in the spring, and I got in a vehicle with a man named Terry Ellis. And we drove this way to look at the penitentiary, and uh, <clears throat> we dropped down a hill out there and started down this way, and he said, I'm gonna stop here and visit with a man. He said, uh, you might want to fasten your seat belt. And went in there and sat down in Denny's restaurant right over there across the highway somewhere. And there was this man in there combing his beard. Um, I never met such an unusual preacher. Um, his name was Charles. You all remember him? Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so that was my first uh, encounter with Pendleton, Oregon. And um, then we went right on up to the penitentiary and walked around the grounds up there and, and the Lord uh, 
uh, kind of confirmed in my heart what I strongly suspicioned before I got out here. And I don't have time to tell you about all that tonight, but uh, he's kept me and my wife uh, 22 years now on this latest endeavor that we've been in. Got saved 47 years ago back in Grinnell, Iowa. It's my home state and uh, I'd been married about five years at that time. And by the way, this is my wife, Diana. And uh, she's the only wife I've ever had. And uh, <clears throat> she would have run off and left me if she'd had any sense of direction, but she don't know where she's going, so she stayed with me. <laughs> uh, so, uh, anyway, um, 25 years, her and I were in school ministry, Christian school ministry. And uh, by the way, that is good preparation for penitentiary work. I'll tell you, I found that to be the truth. Uh, what we got at the penitentiary mostly is just uh, little boys and big bodies. Uh, but there are a few exceptions. Uh, contrary to popular belief, there are some very good men in the penitentiary. Wonderful men. And uh, <clears throat> God's privileged me to be able to work there with those men now for years. And uh, some good things have happened. John 15, uh, 15, 16, I think it is, that, um, that if we bear fruit uh, that remains, we can ask God for what we will and it'll be given to us. And, and so I, um, uh, you know, y'all make me nervous. I don't know whether you know that or not, but I'm a nervous uh, individual up here. When I get, to, it takes me a while to get wound up. They don't let me out in normal congregation very often. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, I've been, last yesterday and today, I've been um, kicking the can around the corner, trying to figure out what I was gonna do here. And uh, I didn't know until just a little bit ago. And so I think I'm just going to do that. I preacher told me I could come and present the ministry and show a DVD. We have one, but I didn't bring it. And um, I don't uh, really feel at liberty to do a presentation on what we do as a missionary without the preacher being here. And so I left all that stuff at the house. I'm just going <clears> to... <throat> read a verse and holler at you about what God's laid on my heart one time about a personal experience, if you don't mind. And uh, so <clears throat> maybe one of these days I'll get by and the right time on a missions endeavor and, and um, you may be able to view what uh, goes on a little bit while we got. Um, we... Uh, <clears throat> We get to looking at uh, this thought tonight. Just what time is it anyway? As I read my Bible now for the last 47 years since I've been saved, uh, it didn't take me long to get uh, my teeth into things. I got saved in the month of March and I was enrolled in a Bible college by uh, August of the same year. When I went to the Bible college, I didn't know that there was a difference between the Old and the New Testament, nor did I know what it meant when they said that. <laughs> I just knew I'd gotten saved. And that uh, I'd made so many visits to the preacher's front door with serious questions that went on to lengthy times that he finally decided maybe I, he better carry me off to a school someplace so he could get some rest. I ended up going right off to a Bible college, dumber than a bag of hammers. I didn't know, I didn't know from up from down about anything in the Bible except that God had saved me and I loved the Bible. Didn't have anything going for me except <clears throat> I was extremely interested in what everything they had to say. And so the first semester I failed all my classes except one. Uh, I passed a course called Church Ed because I didn't give you any test. All you had to do was show up and they gave you an A. <laughs> so I got all F's and one A. <laughs> uh, things picked up though. I did finally graduate about four and a half years later. <clears throat> you may be surprised that I did after you get done listening to me. 
Oh, here we are. I'm eleven. Uh, I'm trying to collect my thoughts here. About ten years ago, my daughter got married. <laughs> How many of you know Amanda? <clears throat> right. Um, she's uh, no, that girl wired up. No. Um, <clears throat> she got married over at Pen uh, Somerville. I was sitting there with my wife on the front pew at that wedding. Brother Umber was doing the wedding. And I was thinking to myself, bless the Lord, I'm going to get rid of all that noise. <laughs> <laughs> One year to the day later, nearly, here come Maddie. And they moved right down the street from me. And I didn't get rid of the noise, it just increased. <laughs> uh, here. <clears throat> she insisted on coming over here to see Anna. And uh, so, anyway, here we are. Uh, let's have a word of prayer. I can't collect my thoughts. Father, thank you for your goodness to us. I would like to be a blessing to these people. These are unusual days. And yet, <clears throat> Lord, I know without a shadow of a doubt that you can do everything. Not only can you do everything, you can do everything very well, way beyond my comprehension. Even use me tonight to be a blessing to people because of the blessed Holy Spirit that indwells me and because of this blessed book that never changes. Well, thank you for all you do. And have done all day. Things that I, can't, I don't even know about. And here we got here. And well, thank you for all that you do now. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, reading my Bible through the years, I have discovered that... <clears throat> uh, in the beginning, in the book of Genesis, in the beginning, God created. And we get to the Revelation, and uh, the Lord makes a declaration that he's going to come quickly. And there was a revelator there talking, even so come Lord Jesus. And I believe he is going to come soon. I'm looking for him to come, and these times that we're living in and these strange events that we've been witnessing uh, increases my interest. For I know, I know that God loves sinners. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And so, looking between the time that we've been afforded uh, in the beginning, I believe God started something that had never happened before. He swung the pendulum of time. At our house, <clears throat> uh, me and my wife had been married 52 years. We lived till April. The first Christmas that we had together, I bought a eight-day clock, mantel clock, and um, it's still running. But my, every Friday, I've got to wind it, and then I've got to start the pendulum every week. If I don't, it stops. But God started the pendulum of time 6,000 years ago, to my recollection. And he's got some things that he's put in our understanding when the Holy Spirit indwells us to be able to st understand what's in the Bible. And it's my understanding that about 2,000 years into time, there was a major event took place that we call the flood. And it was a time of judgment because sin had gotten to be a real problem. How many of you have read about that? How many of you believe the Bible? <laughs> and, uh, you know, then 
after the flood, there was only eight souls left. That's quite a judgment, you know, I believe. I, and so <clears throat> they began to multiply again. And then about 2,000 years later, we ran into a little thing at the end of Malachi and we enter into a space of time that is longer than this nation's history, almost twice. We call it the Dark Ages. Uh, I believe if you'll investigate a little bit, you'll find that God quit talking. Malachi finished up. And then it got dark. You know what the light of the world is? Jesus is the light of the world, right? My word's a lamp to my feet, and light to my path, and if I hide God's word in my heart, I'm not sin against God. Amen. And so, <clears throat> at the end of the 400 years, another major judgment came. And in the first advent of the Christ, we read about it, right? It's a wonderful thing, wasn't it? Amazing event in time. And so at that period of time, based upon what we know about the length of what God has given us to understand about time, we have now exhausted 6,000 years of those 7,000 years that are going to equal all the time that we have. Uh, there's a major event coming, you all know it. You listening for the shout? The voice of the archangel and the trump of God. Um, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse number 13. I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, as others. Um, for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout and the voice of the archangel, and the dead in Christ shall rise first, then we which are alive. I think he's coming. I think he's coming. I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired of this mess. <clears throat> When the trump sounds and we're caught up, then there's going to be a judgment. Not the great white throne judgment, but the judgment seat of Christ. And then there's going to be a declaration of those things which we've done in the body, whether they be good or bad. And, uh, <clears throat> boy, I'm afraid I've got a lot of wood, hay, and stubble. I get to looking back on the years of my ministry and I've done an awful lot of stuff in the flesh. You know, it's wicked to work, spiritual work in the flesh. Pretend like that you're spiritual. Am I the only wicked old sinner in here? Um, boy, we put on, a, put on the dog, don't we? I've been a missionary now for with this segment of my life, me and my wife, and they've called me a missionary. I'm a missionary of the Rock of Ages prison ministry. Uh, I'm housed up here uh, in a local church called the Brian Baptist Church of Walla Walla. We have a great pastor there. <laughs> he came out here about four or five years ago from Kansas, and just a young guy. <clears throat> and been listening to him only about two or three stations, and I walked up to him one afternoon, and I said, listen, son, I've got a goose gun that I can stand right here and reach the county line in any direction. If you try to sneak off on us, I'm gonna shoot you. <laughs> in Christian love. <clears throat> got a great church going and buzzing. I think the church of God ought to be buzzing, don't you? I think we ought to be reading the Bible and be expecting his soon return. Well, there came a time in the history of Christ that something came 
that I read about here in the 26th chapter in the book of Matthew. I'd like to ask you to turn there with me. And then a personal testimony, if I could, about my old wicked heart. I can't begin to tell you all of the things that build up to my being involved in this ministry, but one thing was is I had an older brother. And uh, I had two older brothers, and the oldest one's name was Corky, and the other's name was Peanut. And they called me Skipper. We all had nicknames. As a matter of fact, my wife calls me Skipper all the time. When I graduated from high school, I went across to get some kind of an acknowledgement about a sports uh, something, and they called me Floyd Stevens, and everybody in the auditorium about went berserk with laughter. They'd never heard Floyd before. <laughs> yeah, they couldn't believe my name was Floyd. Right after that, I got a new nickname. They called me Pretty Boy Floyd. <laughs> you remember him as being a notorious gangster, don't you? Well, <clears throat> Peanut shot himself, my brother. <laughs> well, that broke my heart. I was working in a ministry as a school administrator, they called me, in Virginia. <clears throat> really what I was doing is I was rebelling against God. I got upset about some things. I left God's will without permission and I ended up in Virginia there in that school ministry. Well, about five years of that and then God let me up. But uh, it took a lot of doing, but I finally got right with God there for a bit. How many of you have ever been backslidden and got right? Boy, plop, plop, fizz, fizz, oh, what a relief it is, huh? And so, <clears throat> first thing you know, I found myself on deputation, what they call deputation. And me and my wife traveled around the country for about 21 months in a little old van pulling a single axle camper trailer, trying to raise support to go to Pendleton or to Walla Walla, Oregon, uh, uh, to work at the penitentiary. I'm going to tell you what, you run around the country and try to raise support to go and pe preach in a prison, and a lot of people don't understand that. It's just the grace of God, the miracle of God, that we, 21 months is all it took us to get enough groceries to be able to live out here. And so we moved, and about five years into my ministry up there, I remember this particular event. I'd gone in there one morning, and I had one of them year-long days at that prison. Oh, I'm telling you. I'm telling you, them inmates, I'm telling you, they can, they can aggravate you to the place to where you're about ready to go berserk. And just like, just like being in a Christian school with a bunch of teenagers. Only more violent and more abusive with their speech. I'd had a year-long day in there. The next morning I was supposed to go and I had things scheduled and I knew without a shadow of a doubt what God's will was for my life. God had let me up out of the mire. In rebellion, I was in rebellion. They hired me to be a school administrator and I am not a school administrator. I'm an old-fashioned Baptist preacher. I, I'm just against everything. And that'll send men to hell, that is. <clears throat> God had provided for me a Bible. It miraculous the way we got out here. You wouldn't believe it. <clears throat> God did some wonderful things for us. <clears throat> but that morning, there's a post office up in... Milton Freewater, where we live. And I went there. And I pulled up in front of the post office, and I wasn't wanting to go to the penitentiary. How many of you ever had to go someplace that you just didn't want to go? 
my wanna had given up. I didn't want to go. And about that time, I had this radio station on up there, that KOLU thing out of Riverview. And <clears throat> there was some preacher on there. And if I called his name, you'd probably know who he was. I don't know. But he was preaching out of this text that very morning. And <clears throat> in view of what we've got going on here in this country right now, I thought it might be good if I just share a testimony about the way that God spoke to my heart concerning this passage he was talking about. Um, I got this material from listening to a man, and I could never reproduce it like he did, but uh, nonetheless, it's a wonderful thing that God did for me that morning. I pray it'll be a blessing to you. Find in your Bibles down there, it's verse number 36 in chapter 26 of Matthew. We're down to the end of Matthew, and <clears throat> if you've read your Bible or you've been listening or paying attention, you know that the Lord is about ready to go into what we call judgment. He's about ready to give up his life for me. And so there we see <clears throat> that uh, he's with his disciples, and he said he cometh, uh, then cometh Jesus with them unto the place called Gethsemane, and saith unto the disciples, Set ye here while I go and pray yonder. I'd like you to look at that word yonder for a minute. <clears throat> Webster 1828 Dictionary says this about that. It says that it's a distance within view. It's a distance in view, within view. My definition of that is, for a Christian, is some place that you go, when you come to the place to where your flesh ain't going to work anymore. You see here, the Christ that the book of Colossians declares to us spoke everything into existence that's in this world. That's who we're talking about here. He's come to Gethsemane to pray and he left those disciples there and he said he was going to go yonder. <clears throat> he was going to go a distance from them, but not out of their view. You say, what in the world could Christ ever run into <clears throat> that was going to be something that his flesh could not deal with? Now, you know he was the God-man, right? He wasn't a man of God. He was the God-man. Let me even understand the difference in that. You know, Brother Mark's a, God man, a man of God. And his papa, Carl, and your pastor, and Brother Riggins, and, and hopefully some of y'all. Men of God, right? First uh, <clears throat> John 3, 1, I think it is, says, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. So there's a difference between the God-man and the men of God. But this is the God-man. <clears throat> in all points he was tempted like we are, yet without sin. And yet here we find him in this condition. It's an amazing thing. I, I was listening to this fellow on the radio. <clears throat> I was trying to have a pity party. I was trying to tell the Lord it might be better for me to go steelhead fishing than to go to penitentiary because... I'd had a year-long day the day before. I was sick and tired of it. Didn't want less than no more of it. I wasn't having it. And God got to reminding me about what happened to me about when I left God's will and went to walk to the place where I was a school administrator. I thought a man would rather go to prison than go to be a school administrator. <clears throat> wasn't the kids that bothered me. It was the parents. You know, every old crow thinks her crow is the blackest, you know. Oh, I'm telling you, what, them parents drove me nuts. <clears throat> Y'all ain't mad, are you? I... Can you picture the Lord leaving them disciples in this place? And he went yonder, he's going to pray. Now look at this. The next verse, 30, 
7. He took with him Peter, the two sons of Zebedee, and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. How many of you like me when you saw him scaling the walls and breaking into the Capitol building, you got sorrowful and very heavy? You know what time it is? 6,000 years after he started the pendulum. You know what he said is going to happen? He's coming. You know why? Same reason he came had Noah build the ark. Uh, sin is going to get to the place to where he's done with it. It's about over. It's about over. I could stand here and tell you things I've seen in the penitentiary and probably make you want to throw up. But I ain't going to do that. You know. Been watching the news about Portland? <laughs> That's a, that's a that's a normal thing in the prison. <laughs> Sorrowful and very heavy. You know what's going to take place here? He's about ready to experience something he's never experienced. You know what it is? He's not just going to take on my sin. You know, I get to thinking about things I've done. Boy. I feel sorrowful and heavy over that stuff. I wish I'd have never done them things. How many of you have had a history where you wasn't always real good? Hmm. How many of you remember some things that you're not real proud of? How many of you know that God knows everything that you've ever done, some things that you don't even know? He knows the thoughts and the intents of our heart. Now, I'm not just talking about my sin. Now, my sin makes me heavy and sorrowful. When I get, when God deals with me, I, I get sorrowful and heavy. Yeah. Just the other day, I, was, I said to myself, Lord, it ain't right that I feel so good about them tearing that building up. Vengeance is mine, I will repay. You know, I'm, I want to help God out sometimes. You all ever get aggravated and you want to help God out sometime? <laughs> well, I've gotten too old and, you know, I've I, I got to put my teeth in the cup at night, you know, and I'm, I'm frail and I couldn't whip nobody, but um, I, got a, I got a big shotgun. <laughs> I'd like to have... <laughs> um, <laughs> then <clears throat> the next verse look at this thing then saith he unto them my soul is exceeding sorrowful even unto death tarry ye here and watch with me now beloved I want to ask you something how long has he known about this appointment Has it ever occurred to you that nothing ever occurred to God? He's always known about this appointment. You know, we're living in a something we call between the eternities. At the end of the seventh block, after the millennial period, you know that clock's going to stop. Short, never to go again. There was an eternity in the beginning God. He started the pendulum swinging. It's been swinging ever since. It's going to swing till the end of 7,000 years, and then there's going to be a great white throne judgment. Everybody's going to be there. You're not going to cancel the appointment. You might cancel a doctor's appointment. You might cancel a hair appointment. You might cancel all kinds of, you're not canceling that appointment. You're going to be there. Everybody here. Exceeding sorrowful and very heavy. We're talking about 
now, they're talking about somewhere around 8 billion people on the planet. Is that what they're saying? 8 billion people on the planet now. Now, you go, <clears throat> you go backwards and you trace back into time. We're 6,000 years since Adam. Uh, do you know what happened when they sinned? We got into a curse. The preacher was up in uh, Walla Walla. He's preaching about this this morning. <clears throat> the curse came on man because of sin. Um, Brother Carl was telling me he had COVID and some other infection, you know. <clears throat> That's not because God was mad at Brother Carl. Uh, we live in a sin-cursed world. We have diseases. Just because people get sick don't mean that God's mad at them or they've sinned. Uh, now, I, I'm not saying that that don't ever happen, but I don't know. But I know one thing. If I was sick every time that I did something wrong, I'd been sick continuously. I'm a wicked old man now, I'm just telling you. I've not always been a Baptist preacher either. Um, I don't think I'm one now much, but I do love this book. But you know, back in March, God put me on something that I'd never experienced before as a missionary. I've heard missionaries talk about furlough, but I've never been on one until March. And then I started furlough. I've not been able to get to the penitentiary. God put me on a furlough. And you know, that's hard on your pride, you know. I thought I was needed and important. God said, I can get along without you. I've been wrestling that, you know. <laughs> Here's, here's the most difficult thing about it. Our support comes in like clockwork. I've got no visible means of support. God said he'd take care of me and we still got all our bills paid this month. I ain't done nothing. I'm just sitting around taking up space. I think Nancy Pelosi's right. I'm just a deplorable old white man that needs to be exterminated. <laughs> oh, here we are. Are you looking at the Lord here in this condition? Exceeding sorrowful and heavy. He's taking on the sin of the whole world. He's looking at that. Now look what he says. He went a little further, and he fell on his face in verse number 39, and he prayed, saying, O oh, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou will. You know that day in front of the post office, there was no doubt in my mind what God's will was for my life. I, I, I got to thinking, the, the more this guy was preaching at me there, <clears throat> the more I got to thinking, God kept me and my wife not only with our needs met, but way more than our needs. Those 21 months that me and my wife spent after we had been married for 30 years, pulling a single axle camper trailer, staying in Walmart parking lots, was some of the best 21 months that we ever spent in our life. Boy, we enjoyed it. And he just didn't supply the gas and the thing. He gave us way more than what we ever expected. I mean, I was running around the country like I was a king. We was going into restaurants and eating steak. And, I mean, God was good to us. And there I was. Just because I'd had a little bit of verbal abuse and some aggravation, I, I didn't care what God's will was. I was sorrowful and very heavy. I'd want, I didn't want to go. How many of you, some Sunday mornings, you've had a rough week and you just don't think you... Maybe I, maybe I better not go today. Any doubt in anybody's mind that it's God's will that we don't forsake the assembling of ourselves together as a matter of some is? And so much more as you see the day approaching. 
Uh, I think major events is about ready to line up here. The first advent passed 2,000 years back, and the next one, I think, is the next major judgment. Every 2,000 years. 2,000 years from creation to the flood, from the flood to the cross, the cross to the rapture. I think he's coming. I think he's running on schedule, don't you? Yeah, you're looking for him? Now, <clears throat> I'm not saying that these days aren't gonna be difficult. I think 2020 was an unusual year, but I think it may just be the tip of the iceberg. Paul said in Philippians, he said that I might know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings. I just want to tell you, I, I just get excited about the uh, power of his resurrection, but I really want to back away from that suffering business. I, I ain't much interested in that. That's what was the matter with me that morning. <clears throat> now, I, did, I didn't want to go. Now, listen, there ought not to be no doubt in anybody's mind it's saved that you need to be faithful. We ain't got no excuses. Now, I've read about Paul's endeavors and about all of the things that he went through. And he talked about <clears throat> uh, wishing himself to be accursed that his brethren could be saved. Now, listen, um, I just get to looking at myself and I wonder just what in the world's the matter with my spiritual condition. I'm a long way from that. I've been, I've been a long time in it. I'm 47 years into this ministry business. Sometimes I wake up and I'm a lot further away than I'm supposed to be. I was astonished to see him exceeding sorrowful and very heavy. And <clears throat> um, you see what he says. He says, let this cup pass from me nevertheless. I'd encourage you to look up nevertheless, whatever the cost. You know, he did that for me. He was sweating drops of blood because of me. Do you realize what he did for you? Uh, how many of you have suffered more than just being in a sin-cursed world? We are here to serve him. He has saved us. He has bore all of our sin. Not just part of it, but all of it. I have eternal life. When I was confronted with this, God was dealing with me because I had got to the place to where I wanted to move. I got sick of the abuse at the prison. I just, I wanted to move. I thought I could go someplace else and get out from under the... You know, there's no place better for anybody to be than in God's will. Nevertheless. Now, we're liable to face some things here, beloved. Now, this, this country is ripe for judgment. I'm just telling you, there's things, there's things being, been going on in this country. They've, they've said it's legal. Killing babies, it may be legal with government, but it's not legal with God. And numerous and sundry other things that I could bring up that you know very well what they are. And so, what is this? The God-man, sorrowful and very heavy, exceeding sorrowful. Uh, how, how great is sorrow when it's exceeding sorrowful? Very heavy, he is. Uh, it wasn't the fact of the physical abuse, it was the sin. He's gonna take on the sin of the whole world. Everybody has ever been or ever will be. Uh, <clears throat> you know the Lord may tarry a while yet. 2021 might be a real exhausting thing. You know, when, <clears throat> when the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. You know, you know, I don't see much righteousness coming down the pike here. Y'all? 
you know, things might not get better. How many of you have heard people shouting, make America great again? You know what I'm awfully afraid of? I'm afraid that Americans that are crying that, they don't want God to make God, uh, America godly. They want government to make America carnal so they can continue to live as though the church was an activity. This is not an activity. Came up at the penitentiary here about 10 years ago. I went in there one morning. I've got to sign up. I've got to sign up. It's, it's necessary. All this stuff's necessary. I'd go in and sign in because I'm not an employee. They call me a volunteer chaplain. So <clears throat> I went in, and there was this thing there, and there was a note right above the sign-in sheet. It said, any religious volunteers, when you're going to go to the chapel from now on, you don't sign in that you're going to the chapel, sign in that you're going to the religious activity center. It struck a nerve with me. I ran the state chaplain down. I said, Fred, uh, can I ask you something? He said, sure. I said, come here, I want to ask you about it. I took him out to the sign-in box. I said, uh, religious activity center? He said, yeah, the rack, just put RAC. I said, no, I ain't doing it. He said, what? I said, no, I'm not doing it. He said, how's come? I said, I'm not religious, and I don't hold activities. I'm here as an ambassador of God. I come here doing the business of God. There isn't nothing more important than God's business. Have you come to look at the church as an activity? Is that something that you do or you don't do based upon how comfortable you are? America is in that condition now, beloved. Now, I know I look like I fell off a bunk, uh, load of pumpkins yesterday, <clears throat> but I have traveled this nation. I have visited churches all over this place. I believe what, God's, uh, what people are saying, <clears throat> they don't want this nation to be godly. They want it to be carnal. They want it to be comfortable. They want stimulus checks to keep coming. Are we trusting God or are we trusting government? Uh, <clears throat> is there any doubt in your mind that the Christ knew what God's will was before the foundation of the world? God's will was is that Christ was to come to die for the sins of the world. Came to save sinners, right? to seek and to save that which is lost. There is no doubt in his mind what the will of God. When you get up on Sunday mornings or it's time to be faithful to your missions giving or your tithes and your offerings, listen, <clears throat> there's, there's nothing to pray about there. God runs his business on the tithes and the offerings of God's people. God loves a cheerful gift. <clears throat> we ought not to have to pray about it or even talk about that, but we have to. Why? Uh, we had one of them year-long nights. We got up and we went to the mailbox and there was a tax bill or something was broke down or we just couldn't trust God to meet the needs if we tithed. Had to hoard it. Um, listen, I'm just asking you to look at where we're at. What time is it anyway? No, I'm not talking about the clock. I'm talking about what time is it? We're 6,000 years into this. I'm 76 years old. I got one foot in the grave and the other on a banana peel. I'm on borrowed time. I don't know why God puts up with me. You realize what happened when the children of Israel began to murmur? And you ever read about that? Um, 
Uh, yeah. Sorry. I usually preach a long time at the penitentiary. Um, Nevertheless, not as I will, but I will. He cometh unto the disciples and findeth them asleep. And said unto Peter, What could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray, lest ye enter into temptation. And the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And he went away again the second time and prayed again, saying, O oh my Father, if this cup may not pass away from me, except I drink it, thy will be done. And he came and he found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. And he left them and he went away again and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Then cometh he to his disciples and saith unto them, Sleep on now and take your rest. Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise and let us be going. Behold, he is at, the, at hand that doth betray me. I want you to notice about three things and then I'm gonna sit down. Yonder is a distance within view, but in my case, it's a place to where I go when I realize that I've been working in the flesh and I need God again. Uh, we need to go yonder because we can't live the normal Christian life in the energy of the flesh. As long as we're doing that, we're going to have the chaos we got in this nation. This is not an activity. When you go yonder, this is what you'll find. You'll find not only the uh, power to be able to know what God's will is, but to accept it. It's one thing to know what God's will is. It's another thing altogether to accept God's will. When you go yonder, you'll find the power it takes to tolerate weakness. You watch him coming, those disciples, he's admonished them. What could you not watch one hour and pray? Watch and pray, lest you enter in. How many of you find yourself going to sleep on God, weary? Uh, how many of you look around and you find fault with other church members because they're not measuring up? You know, let's, if this church is going to be healthy, or any church, you have got to know, you've got to have the power to be able to not only know what God's will is, but to do it and accept it. You've got to have the power to be able to tolerate weakness in others. There ain't nobody perfect here. This place is full of sinners saved by grace. Or it may be full of sinners not saved by grace. I don't know who's here, but you all know in yourself whether you're right with God or not. And then there's one final thing that you'll find power to be able to do that I needed desperately that morning. You'll be able to find yonder the power you need to be able to forgive wickedness. I'm telling you, you have no idea about the vicious, animal-like, modern-day slavery that's in those gangs, in those prisons. That's all that is in gangs, that's just modern-day slavery. They get those boys in there and they get them in a gang. If they try to leave, they'll attack their families. They'll put great hurt on them. Tonight, there's a place called the altar at the Old Fashioned Church. It's a place to where you can go. A distance within view and find the power you need to live the normal Christian life. It's time that God's people quit having activities and got serious about God's business.
Okay, turn your songbook to page number 500. 500. Go ahead and stand with me if you would, please. The altar's open. Pass me not, O gentle Savior, hear my humble cry. While on others thou art calling, do not pass me. Bye. 